and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28 and verse 20. A father and his 10-year-old daughter were spending their holiday at the seashore. One day they went out to enjoy a swim in the ocean and although they were both good swimmers, some distance out from the shore they became separated. The father, realizing that they were being carried out to sea by the tide, called his child, Mary, I'm going to shore for help. If you get tired, turn on your back. You can float all day that way. I'll come back for you. Before long, many searchers in boats were scurrying over the face of the water, hunting for one small girl. Hundreds of people on the shore had heard the news and were waiting anxiously. It was four hours later before they found her, far from land, but she was calmly floating on her back and not at all frightened. Cheers and tears of joy and relief greeted the rescuers when they came back to land with their precious burden. But the child took it all calmly. She seemed to think it was strange the way they acted. She said, Father said I could float all day on my back and that he will come for me. So I just swam and floated because I knew he'd come. Last week, we talked about the covenant between God and Abraham. Today, we want to study more about the purpose of that covenant. And we will also discover what God wants to do with those who join Him in this eternal covenant. Welcome to lesson number five, Children of the Promise. This is part of the series, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. Your host, Rudy Vivanco, welcomes you. And before we pray, I want to thank you for sharing this video, for giving a thumbs up, and also to, for subscribing to our channels. Thank you very much, and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for the opportunity to come together once again and study this precious covenant that you not only invited Abraham to be part of, but also you invited us to be part of. We pray, Father, your blessings today be with us as we try to learn the lessons you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So there are benefits that we are to receive out of this covenant that the Lord is inviting us to be part. There are different benefits that the Lord wants us to receive through this, this covenant. And one of them is found in Genesis 15 and verse 1. So let's go to the Bible and read this from the Bible. Genesis 15 and verse 1. The Bible says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Listen, friends. God said to Abram, I am your shield. Do you hear? God presents himself to Abram in a personal way because our God is a personal God. He's not a shield, but your shield the shield of each one of us. So when he said this to Abraham, he was also hoping that you will come and read that and take it personal. Other biblical authors also saw God as a shield. We can find this in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 29, 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 3, and Psalm 7 and verse 10, and also in Psalm 18, verse 30. But what is, what are the implications of this, I am your shield? What is God trying to say with this phrase, I am your shield? Well, number one, he is talking about physical protection. And number two, he's talking about protection against temptation. And when it comes to physical protection, uh, we can base this on, on Psalm 91 and verses 4 through 7. And there, if you read Psalm 91 and verse 4 through 7, you will find there the reality that God can deliver us from any danger, although at times He may decide not to. When it comes to protection against temptation, and for that, uh, I want you to check 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And you will find there that God will always protect from temptation those who ask Him. Listen, friend, 
If you take shelter behind him, the divine shield will always protect you from circumstances that could prevent you from reaching salvation. There is no one else in the whole universe that is more concerned about your salvation than God himself. And, and so he wants to protect you, number one. He wants to bless you, number two. And for that, we are going to go to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Shall be blessed. Wait, in what way were all the families of the earth to be blessed through Abraham? In what way? On the one hand, through the physical descendants of Abraham, the world will know the plan of redemption. And that is simply how God was planning to rescue his children. But the full blessing was to come through your seed, God says. That is, the seed of Abraham. And this is found in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 14. Genesis 28, 14. And in the New Testament, we will find Paul talking about this same subject. And he makes it clear that the promised seed specifically refers to Jesus Christ. And this is Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians 3, 16. Therefore, dear friend, the Redeemer himself becomes the means by which the covenant commitments and all other promises are fulfilled. The promises of God are fulfilled in and through Jesus. So this is something very important for us to recognize and to uh, acknowledge so that we may accept it. Number one, through this covenant, God wants to protect you. Number two, God wants to bless you. Number three, God wants to save you. For that, we are going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. This is what the Bible says. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now picture the kind of world that we're living in. In this world dominated by sin and evil, our only security of reaching a better world is in taking refuge in the shield and trusting in the seed. Because what was impossible for us, namely paying the price for our sins, according to Psalm 49 and verse 8, Jesus made possible with his death and resurrection. This is why Jesus came to live in this world. This is why Jesus had to die. And this is why Jesus had to resurrect. Because through this, he brings the benefits of the covenant to you. Even today, dear friends, he continues to intercede for each of us through his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. And this is taught by Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and also Hebrews 7, 25. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and Hebrews 7, 25. Listen, dear friend, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant. Please know this. He is the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant promise that God made to Abraham. It's through Jesus that we receive the, 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 the benefits. It's through Jesus that we are saved. It's through Jesus that we are protected. It's through Jesus that we are blessed. It's all about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And that's why the devotional reflecting Christ January 7th says the following, what a precious Savior Jesus is. Security, help, trust, and peace are in him. He is the dispeller of all our doubts, the pledge of all our hopes. How precious is the thought that we can truly become partakers of the divine nature with which we can overcome as Jesus did. Jesus is the fullness of our expectations. He is the melody of our hymns, the shadow of a great rock in the desert. He is the living water for the thirsty soul. He is a refuge in the storm. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. When Christ is our personal Savior, we will announce the virtues of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is always always Jesus. And once you accept the way to receive the blessings, Jesus Christ, then you receive protection, you receive the blessings, you receive salvation through Jesus. But once you receive these three benefits, 
there is a reaction to those benefits and we read it at the end of that quote and that is that you will want to tell everyone about your savior for that we are going to go and this is one of the benefits also of the covenant we are going to go to deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 6 deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 6 the bible says therefore be careful to observe them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people imagine this friend when god made promises to abraham he did not even have a son to inherit them however when they left egypt abraham's descendants were already a great people god ratified his covenant with these people and entrusted them with a concrete mission what was it to be an example for all the nations a light in the darkness and this is according to isaiah 60 and verses 1 through 3. isaiah 60 1 to 3. the divine intention was for humanity to seek the god of israel and accept the messiah the savior of the world that was his plan that's why Christ was to be uplifted. He was to be lifted before all nations and that everyone will come to him. Friend, friend, this is present truth. And this is found in Patriarchs and Prophets. This is what the author says. The children of God are his representatives on earth and he wants them to be light in the middle of the moral darkness of this world. Scattered throughout the earth, in towns, cities, and villages, they are witnesses of God, the means by which he has to communicate to an unbelieving world the knowledge of his will and the wonders of his grace. He wants to do it through you. So that's another benefit that you come to be an instrument of God to reach more people for his kingdom, to save people. What a responsibility, don't you think? Let me bring to you the last benefit of this covenant, covenant between Abraham and God that also benefits us. This is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. Genesis 12, 2, the Bible says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. At Babel, men wanted to make themselves great by building a tower. You remember this. But they were humbled by God. And you can find this in Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 and 8. So I want you to see they, were, they thought they were great, but God brought them down to their reality by bringing humility to them. But God took a humble man, Abraham, and made him great. So these men thought they were great, they wanted to be great, and God brought them back down to humility. This man, Abraham, was humble, and God brought him up to greatness. Why? James chapter 4 and verse 6 tells us why. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's a reality. That's a fact. However, the greatness with which God exalted Abraham is not the same greatness that the world understands as such. See friends, in God's sight, greatness has to do with character, faith, obedience, humility, and above all, love for others. Therefore, do not seek your own greatness. Let it be God who makes you great. Allow God to bring you to the greatness that He has prepared for you. He wants you to be great, but He wants to perform that miracle, to bring somebody like you, to bring somebody like me to experience greatness. In the covenant that we have studied for two weeks, Abraham receives the benefits from this loving God, benefits that you and I can also receive today. What are those? Protection, blessing, salvation. And when you receive these three benefits out of this contract that you enter voluntarily with God, you are also to react by announcing the good news to everyone. And when you experience all these four benefits, there is one more that God has for you through Jesus, and that is that He's going to make you experience greatness. All these thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ. So my, my prayer now is that you will continue working with Him and you may accept his invitation to be the other party of the covenant so that you may receive 
those blessings. May the Lord bless you, and I will see you next week.